What's up, everybody? Welcome back to Mile Higher Podcast, episode 169. Today, we are covering the disappearance of Maura Murray, which is a very famous case, um, probably one of the most well-known missing persons cases of all time. We have covered it in our very early days of podcasting. I wonder what many, episode that was. Many moons ago, we covered yeah, it. Yeah, I think we were in our first space which yeah. was a tiny little room in the basement of the old house yep with the with our uh, beautiful green screen mm. yeah green screen yeah those oh, days yeah don't miss that yeah fun times the green screen forgot about that damn <laughs> but um we wanted to cover it again because it was taken off of youtube actually just a few months after we posted it so yeah, we a lot a of you didn't get to see it. it yeah holy we fuck. literally got striked this is the only episode we've ever really well second episode we've been striked for that actually stuck um, we had another one that fell off, but yeah. this one just straight up got perma removed and it took us forever to figure out why. Cause we were like, yeah, was it something related to the more Murray case mm -hmm. that got it taken down? But with, you know, we like, went through everything. I mean, Josh was drinking a beer on the show. Like sometimes you just used to drink a beer yeah. while we were recording. We were like, did that get it taken down? Mm -hmm. But we no. have cocktail hour on the sesh. That definitely wasn't it. <laughs> I know. That's definitely not it. So I think we have figured out the mystery. We said a certain person's name who we shall not say again. Ends in with order Jones, if yeah. you know, mm. uh, you know, conspiracy yeah. theorist. Apparently that's not allowed on YouTube to even say yeah. his name. So, well, he's uh, been like completely removed from the platform mm -hmm. altogether. And I guess even just talking about him got, you know, got you taken down. So which was very, you know. It was a huge bummer for us because yeah. I mean we really did work hard on that we that did. episode and so we were like let's let's revisit it I mean we're much better podcasters now we, we are. do much better research <laughs> than we used to I used to literally do all the research and everything every single week mm -hmm. which was a huge daunting task for me mm -hmm. and I edited the show back then but now we have a whole team of people that are sort of involved with the production of the show so we have we feel much more confident going in this episode that we're going to cover it much better than we did before yeah and it's one of the ones that the two of us have always been fascinated in long oh, before yeah. we were podcasting because it's really just intriguing if you're familiar with the case you know how many different paths it could possibly go down and how many theories there are out there and how just frustrating and perplexing it truly is yeah um so yeah we're gonna go over it again so before we dive into this case I wanted to remind everybody that I have recently announced a new podcast that I am hosting and launching on July 26th. I've gotten so many comments and just messages from people saying, you know, my voice is soothing and you like to fall asleep to mile higher. You like to fall asleep to lights out somehow, some way. And <laughs> that cannot be good for I'm your like, brain. And I'm like, what, what are you doing? Like that can't be good content to listen to while you fall asleep. I guess it works for some people. But I, I, you know, I thought long and hard. I was like, okay, you know what? I'm going to do something really cool here. I'm going to make a sleep podcast, a podcast specifically made to help you fall asleep. But I'm not going to fill your head with a bunch of horrible, horrific, <laughs> you know, crimes and murder and violence and, and whatever else, demonic hauntings and things like that. And, you know, because your subconscious is important. You got to <laughs> nurture that. And so many people are filling their subconscious with all these things and I don't know how you're you're sleeping very well when listening to this stuff while going to bed. But well, you fell asleep to a shark show last night and you're like deathly afraid of sharks. So I'm not afraid of sharks anymore. Actually. No, you're I am not. You're I've, I've conquered my fear with that. that. I'm ready to get in the water with them. <laughs> OK, so mm. all right, I, I will do I'll it. Plan it. I will do it. Right, I, I feel very comfortable. I would with like that. to see that. All right. Very much. We'll show everybody <laughs> that I can swim with sharks. OK. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, the sleep podcast is called Planet Sleep. It's going to be all about nature. I'm going to be taking you all over the world and maybe into outer space. And I'm going to talk about a bunch of different things related to that location, the animals, creatures, the people, uh, you know, even bringing up some of some of the issues with some of the places. I mean, the mm -hmm. Amazon rainforest is the first episode. And I talk about a lot of different things that are going on with the Amazon rainforest, both good and bad. Mm -hmm. And but not like so bad we're gonna be like oh this is a bummer but like, anxiety yeah. exactly but it's gonna be a lot of very soothing music and educational and mm -hmm. nature sounds it's very relaxing if you haven't heard the trailer yet it's out there on apple Podcasts and spotify and on youtube i will not be on camera for this ep or this podcast it'll be all audio but it'll have beautiful imagery mm -hmm. uh that go along with it so i'm very excited for it and hopefully you are too i am i'm gonna be listening 
Yeah. Oh yeah. Why wouldn't I? That's true. We I should... fall asleep to garbage at night, like every night. Reality it's so TV. Bad. And it's so bad. It's not good for your brain. Cooking shows. And... It's annoying. It's I know like it You is. want something that's actually going to lull you to sleep and actually like help you relax and get your heart rate down and get get you into that mindset for mm -hmm. peaceful slumber. Maybe set you up for better dreams even. Yeah, Because exactly. I have pretty chaotic dreams. Exactly. Maybe I need to listen to it. Yeah, you should. I should. Maybe we'll both listen to you every night. I'll oh, listen to myself fall asleep. <laughs> Do you think you could fall asleep to your own voice? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I couldn't. Virgo. I would just rip myself apart Virgo. the whole time. <laughs> of course you can. <laughs> yeah, it'll be it'll be really interesting to see what everybody thinks about it, you know, when you hear a full episode mm -hmm. and everything. We've we've been working really hard on it. I'm, I'm, my brother is producing the show, so um, we're very excited for you all to hear it. So we'll put all the links for it below. Uh, but, yeah, we hope you check it out. And also one last little announcement, uh, Higher Love, we released our watermelon haze yes, flavor of CBD oil oh, and CBD so wax. Good, you guys. I just have to brag for a second. It the, the taste is so good and you can smell it through the packaging. Like when it's completely sealed, you can smell the bottle and you'll Damn. get the watermelon smell. I got it through my package the other day and I thought one of them leaked, but it was just that strong. You could smell the outside of the package. The watermelon flavor might be my favorite yet. I mean, I love the pineapple, but the watermelon is so good. I'm so excited for you guys to try it. If you like our gummies, we have a watermelon flavored gummy. I think you'll really like the tincture and the wax. Definitely. If you guys want to check out the new watermelon haze collection, it's at higherlovewellness.com. Yep. And we yeah. hope you enjoy it. Yeah. And you can use code homies always to get 10% off your order. All right, but let's go ahead and get into the Mara Murray case. We got a lot to cover, a lot of yeah. theories to discuss at the mm -hmm. end, because there's just so many rabbit holes you can go down with this one. There really is. So Mara Murray, she was born on May 4th, 1982 in Hanson, Massachusetts, to her parents, Fred and Laurie Murray. She had three older siblings, Fred Jr., Kathleen, and Julie, and then one younger brother named Curtis. They were a very close-knit family. Mora was very close with her siblings, especially her sisters. They were devout Irish Catholics, but her parents ended up getting divorced when she was only six years old, and that was a pretty messy situation. While the kids lived with their mom, Laurie, Fred was still an active father, and Mora had a strong bond with both parents. Mora was also very social. She had a big group of friends who spent a lot of time together. Her friends describe her as a free spirit and a goofball who loved to laugh. She loved the outdoors as well and was a very active young woman. She was a star athlete, in fact. In high school, she was a top runner on the track team and on the cross country team. She and her older sister, Julie, were on the high school track team and their dad, Fred, was their coach. Maura and Julie weren't just sisters, they were best friends, but they were very competitive with each other, especially when it came to sports. As she got older, Maura and Fred spent more and more time together. He was always supportive of her athletic goals, and when he wasn't her coach, he took her to every practice, and they never missed a meet. Maura was an incredibly smart kid. She did very well in school, and after graduating high school, she had her pick of top colleges. She ended up deciding to go to West Point Military Academy in New York which is a very prestigious school that only accepts about 10% of applicants. Students are challenged mentally and physically at West Point. They have to pass difficult courses, adhere to a strict code of ethics, and train in hand-to-hand -hand combat and survival skills. Julie was already there, making the decision a lot easier for Mara. She knew she wanted to be with her sister, so she enrolled at West Point and majored in chemical engineering. But after only three semesters at West Point, she abruptly withdrew from school and enrolled at the University of Massachusetts Amherst College of Nursing, which is a highly competitive program. Because it turned out, that Mora didn't have a great track record at West Point, as she had been brought before a disciplinary committee seven times in 2001. So the July before she withdrew from school, Mora was with classmates on a training trip to Fort Knox, which pff, Fort Knox is one of the most secure places in the entire world. And while she was there, she was caught shoplifting makeup from the commissary, which this was really out of character for Mora. After she was caught, she admitted what she had done and fully cooperated with the school's investigation. An honor investigative hearing at West Point determined there was enough evidence to take her case to the cadet advisory board. And the advisory board made the final decision, which was announced in late January 2002 by the superintendent, and Mara was forced to withdraw from West Point on January 2nd, 2002. 
and that's when she went to UMass. During the spring semester at UMass, she stayed very busy as she was in the nursing program and had demanding classes and clinical work, as well as trying to do two part-time jobs. It's a lot. It's a ton of work to do. Nursing programs are really hard. Oh yeah, I don't know how nurses do it, honestly. Like, I know. It's so much you gotta know and memorize, it's just, it's wild. But Mara made friends really quickly, and she had a group that she hung out with. She also had a long distance boyfriend named Billy Roush, who was a few years older than her. She had actually met Billy at West Point in 2001, and he was now stationed at Fort Sill in Oklahoma. They had broken up for a short time, at least once before, but they were trying to make their long distance relationship work. And by the fall of 2003, Mora was back in trouble again. That November, she had food delivered to her dorm room six times, spending a total of $79.02 using a credit card number that didn't belong to her. A woman who lived in her dorm noticed the charges from Pinocchio's Pizza and two other restaurants on her statement, and she ended up contacting the police about her stolen credit card. And there is a lot of talk um, about this case in general online all over the place. But just about the idea of what Mora was ordering, she was ordering uh, multiple sandwiches and pizzas at once. And it's not clear if she was sharing with someone else or she was ordering all of this for herself. There's been a lot of talk about Mora being bulimic. And this seems to be something that other friends of her can back up. And, you know, I just wanted to point out that we don't necessarily know if she had binge eating disorder along with her bulimia. They're different things. Um, sometimes they do go together, but we don't necessarily know that that's what she, right. that she was ordering it. I, I think it's more likely she was ordering it maybe for someone else that she was with. Yeah. Maybe some friends or something. I don't or, know. I mean, there were some relationships going on, which we'll get more into. So yeah, that's true. But police officers from the Amherst police department contacted the restaurants and discovered that all the orders were being delivered to Mora's dorm room. That night, another order was called into Pinocchio's Pizza for the same address, and the officers followed the delivery driver to catch Mora in the act. After she signed the receipt, the officers moved in to confront her. And eventually, Mara admitted that she had found the credit card number on a receipt in the dorm bathroom and had used it, in fact, to buy food. And there's actually a photo of her um, from this incident. And... I mean, I don't know if it's just the camera. I mean, mugshots never look that yeah. great anyway, but it does look scary. And I know multiple people have yeah. noted that she looks different than how she looks in other pictures. Totally. Yeah, her demeanor is very almost like menacing looking. Mm -hmm. Congress actually set the standard for limiting credit card digits on printed receipts in 2003. And states have enacted their own legislation from 1999 to 2009. So it's possible that at this time, full credit card numbers were still being printed on receipts. Because that's the thing mm -hmm. too. Like, is that really true? Did she really get the number from a receipt or did she obtain it some other way? But it sounds like it was possible for mm -hmm. it to have just been on the receipt, which I kind of, I don't know. For some reason, I feel like I remember <laughs> when this was a thing. I don't know why. I don't know. Really? Yeah. I almost remember like looking at receipts from you know in the early 2000s <laughs> that seems i don't know so if I was, stupid well, how is that ever a thing this is this is this is kind of bad but i did <laughs> use my grandparents credit card one time oh, by this method of of pulling it off a receipt oh <laughs> i think i told him about it later on but i did order some stuff <laughs> with their credit card once <laughs> well with this particular order mora did order enough subs pizzas and salads for multiple people but mora was alone in her room which lends to sort of the mm -hmm. theory you just put forward. Right. Mora came in a few days after they had caught her and taken the picture of her to give a statement to the police. And apparently Mora was very cooperative and apologetic. She went into the station by herself and owned up to her mistakes. There was a court hearing that was scheduled for December 18th for improper use of a credit card under $250. And at the hearing, the judge ordered her to repay the money and said if she stayed out of trouble for three months, the charges would be dropped. Otherwise, she'd be charged with identity theft and credit card fraud. I'm just wondering why, why steal the money? Oh, you know, like obviously she knows that's wrong. So, and she's, she's working multiple jobs. Like she doesn't have enough money to buy I know. the food herself. That's what I'm, I'm so curious about is, why why take the risk to steal mm -hmm. credit card numbers when you're already working jobs mm -hmm. i guess i guess maybe if she had this 
you know, binge eating disorder or something along those lines. Like maybe she couldn't afford the amount of food she needed. I, I don't know. That's what's just so weird to me is why steal the credit card numbers? Well, it's possible that she kind of got a rush of adrenaline from doing these small things. I think there's a lot of people out there. Yeah. I mean, why take such a risk to steal a few cosmetics from West Point? Yeah. Fort you know, Knox. I mean, yeah, Fort Knox, actually. <laughs> yeah. So it doesn't seem, I don't know. So it gives us insight into maybe her, you know, the inside of her brain and, yeah. and character, just like she gets a adrenaline mm-hmm. rush from stealing things. Which is really interesting because the first initial coverage of Maura Murray, like on 2020, or I think um, Investigation Discovery did like a split episode with someone else where they covered it and they really left a lot of this out and made Maura look like this all-American sweetheart, never done anything in her life when Maura did have some flaws and things that she was struggling with. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of insight of her life up until the point that she actually disappears. And that's what we're going to get into next. But before we dive into all that, we're going to take a quick ad break and we'll be right back. Before I started doing podcasts for a living, I actually worked in the world of technology, specifically cybersecurity. And I know firsthand how easy it is for a hacker to obtain your usernames, your passwords, personal information, credit card information when you are on a public Wi-Fi or even at home. And that's why using the internet without ExpressVPN is like taking a call on a train or bus on speaker for everyone to hear. You don't know who has access to your most private and sensitive information. So I'll say what I'd say to anyone putting a private call on speaker on a public transport. Don't be that person. Here's why I use ExpressVPN. Internet service providers like Comcast or Verizon know every single website you visit. And in the U.S., they can legally sell this information to ad companies and tech giants who then use your data to target you and make you spend more money. ExpressVPN creates a secure encrypted tunnel between your device and the Internet so people can't peep on your online activity, especially when you're out in public places at coffee shops, hotels. If you're not using ExpressVPN to secure your Internet traffic, then you are leaving yourself wide open to anyone else that's on that network. And what's great about ExpressVPN is that you just fire up the app and click one button, which makes it super simple. It works on phones, laptops, even routers, so everyone who shares your Wi-Fi can be protected. Secure your online activity today at expressvpn.com slash milehigher and get an extra three months free. That's expressvpn.com slash milehigher. Again, that's expressvpn.com slash milehigher to secure your internet again that's expressvpn.com slash mile higher so i know we all love the feeling of a fresh clean mouth for me i feel like it gives me a fresh start to my day to my evening i just love it and i absolutely love my oral routine using quip products and now quip has mouthwash you guys mouthwash hasn't changed for 140 years most brands are still selling those big bulky bottles and they're mostly filled with water and alcohol and that's why the oral care experts at quip have created a mouthwash that gives you more of the ingredients that you need and less of the stuff that already comes out of your faucet plus their alcohol free four times concentrated mouthwash comes in an eco-friendly refill bottle that's 100 recyclable It's their way of helping your mouth a little cleaner and helping make the earth a little greener. And I love the Quip mouthwash. It's so refreshing, so light, and you can tell that it's not saturated with a bunch of who knows what. Plus their bottle is actually pleasant to look at so you don't have to hide it underneath your sink. Quip, of course, has other oral care products such as their electric toothbrushes, which are awesome. I've been using mine for about three years now, and they have floss as well. Their mouthwash kills bad breath germs, helps prevent cavities, and leaves you feeling fresh thanks to a formula that gives your mouth everything it needs and nothing that it doesn't. Their four times concentrate has fluoride, xylitol, and CPC, but they left out the artificial colors and stinging alcohol you'll find in a lot of other rinses. Join the over 5 million mouths already using Quip and start swishing today. And if you go to getquip.com slash milehire5, right now you can get $5 off a mouthwash starter kit. That's $5 off a mouthwash starter kit, which includes a refillable dispenser and a 90-day dose supply of Quip's four times concentrated fluid. You can get that at getquip.com slash milehire5. That's G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash milehire5. Quip, the good habits company. As you guys know, we own our own wellness brand. 
It's our own little small company. And one of the things that has absolutely saved us not only time and money and brain power is stamps.com. We use stamps.com to print all of our postage for all of our packages every single day to all of our customers. And they make it super simple to do so. But best of all, we don't have to go to the post office at all. We can mail and ship anytime, anywhere, right from our computer. And we can send you know all different sizes of mail and packages. But best of all, we pay a ton less than we would normally. What's great about stamps.com is they offer us deals that you can't get anywhere else. Like we get up to 40% off all USPS postage and up to 66% off UPS shipping rates, which if you've ever shipped anything with UPS before, you know how expensive it is even for a small package. So stamps.com really comes in clutch with the major savings. And with their switch and save feature, you can quickly compare carriers to find the best rates every time. And once you've got your postage printed and on your packages, you don't have to go to the post office. All you gotta do is schedule a pickup and somebody comes and gets it for you and ships it off. It's super simple and it's no wonder that 1 million small business owners like us save time and money with stamps.com. So stop wasting going to the post office and go to stamps.com instead. There's no risk and with our promo code mile higher, you get a special offer that includes a four week trial plus free postage and a digital scale. What a deal. No long-term commitments or contracts required. Again, just go to stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and then type in mile hire, all one word. That's stamps.com. Use promo code mile hire today, and you'll never have to go to the post office again. So Mora ended up finishing her fall semester, and then she went back to school after winter break. And on Thursday, February 5th, she was scheduled for a late night shift at the security desk in Melville Hall, which is near her building, Kennedy Hall. The first several hours of work were pretty uneventful, other than taking a few calls on her cell phone. At 12.40 a.m., she took a call at the security desk phone that was later traced to an on-campus telephone line. Around 1 a.m., Mara was seen sobbing uncontrollably. Her coworkers called their supervisor, Karen, who tried to find out what was going on. Mara eventually stopped crying and just stared blankly ahead, almost like she was in a trance. She started crying softly again, pointed out her phone, and all she would say is, my sister. Karen told Mora that she could go home early, and she walked her back to her dorm at Kennedy Hall. She offered to come up with her and talk, but Mora said that she'd be okay. She just wanted to be alone. Her roommate was home, but this was a lie. She actually lived alone at this time. As far as anyone knows, she went to bed without talking to anyone else. And then that Friday, February 6th, was a normal day for her. Cell phone records later showed who Mora had been talking to on her cell phone that night during her shift. The first call was with her sister, Kathleen, between 10.10 and 10.30 p.m. Which that call was just like a normal catch-up call with them. They were talking about guy problems and things like that. Yeah. It's pretty... Well, it could have been pretty heavy stuff that her sister was dealing with. Yeah. That we, Mora well, we was don't. there for right. her. Um, but the second call was with her boyfriend, Billy. They talked from 12.07 to 12.14 a.m. And no one knows who called the security desk phone at 12.40 a.m. Early Saturday, February 7th, Mara's dad picked her up to go car shopping. She drove a 1996 black Saturn. And according to Fred, he was taking his daughter car shopping because the eight-year-old Saturn was in terrible condition and always breaking down on her. Her sister Julie said the same thing as well, so she confirmed this. Mara lived and worked on campus but had to make long drives to do her clinical work for her nursing program. She had been carpooling with a friend that entire semester. Fred visited her on campus at least once a month and stayed at a nearby motel in Amherst. Mara didn't tell any of her friends that her dad was coming that day or that she was going car shopping. They were out shopping all afternoon and then Fred took Mara and her friend Katie from the track team out for dinner. Neither of them mentioned car shopping in front of Katie though. After dinner, Fred took the girls to a liquor store to buy alcohol for another friend's party. Mara was 21 and could buy the alcohol herself. He's changed this story a few times, though, over the years. At first, he claimed he waited in the car while Mara and Katie went inside. Later, he said he told them to hurry up while they were in the store, implying he had gone in, too. That part's always been really confusing to me. Like, that's such a strange thing to change your story possibly about. lie yeah. about. Yeah. yeah, very weird. But after buying alcohol, Fred drove back to the motel and then let Mora drive his brand new Toyota Camry to the party. Brand new. Yeah. She was supposed to return it later that night, even though he knew there'd be drinking at the party since they were bringing all the alcohol. 
The party was at Maura's friend's house, a coworker named Sarah, who she worked with at her second job at an art gallery. Katie wasn't really friends with Sarah, and most of the people at the party didn't know Mara or Katie. And there's never been any proof of who else was at this party. When Katie and Sarah were questioned later on, they both claimed they didn't remember who was there or what happened at the party or even who Mara talked to or if she left with anyone that was there. That seems really strange. I understand drinking and blacking out at points and not remembering certain details, but to not remember any of it, none of them, right. not remember a single other person was there, anything that happened, anyone Mora was with. You'd have to show up like blacked out. Yeah. Or I was going to say like be drugged. That's, like, I mean, you know, they like, could have. I'm not saying that, that that happened, but it's so, that's crazy yeah. to not remember anything. It seems like you would have to have some type of like roofing in your system or something to, to, not, to remember not remember any anything. Of it. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that's it's or they're protecting strange. people that's what i'm saying right or there's something that happened or something you know they mm -hmm. don't want people to know about that's what it seems like to me but Mora likely left about 2 30 a.m or 3 a.m in the morning to return her dad's car to the motel katie had tried to get her to stay and return the car in the morning knowing that Mara had been drinking but she insisted on leaving anyway around 3 30 a.m Mora approached a t intersection on her way to the motel with the option to take a right or left turn. But she didn't turn at all. She just drove straight into the guardrail and actually totaled her dad's brand new Camry. The insurance company later estimated $8,000 to $10,000 worth of damage, and a police officer came to the scene and wrote an accident report. But there's no record of a sobriety test or even that Mara got into any trouble for this car wreck. That seems incredibly odd, especially because it wasn't just a car to car accident, something that could have happened where they could have just not thought she was drinking. But I think any officer would come to a scene where someone just drove straight forward into a guardrail instead of taking yeah. either of the turns would test them for sobriety. Yeah. It just doesn't make sense. 330 in the morning. Right. Yeah. yeah. Wouldn't that be the first thing you think of a young college student? Yeah. Yeah. It's something seems really weird about that as well. Yeah, I don't really think know if there's really an explanation for it mm -hmm. other than, I don't know, either she got super lucky and the cop just was like, you know, or or she She's just lazy or I don't know. Or she made something up or maybe she know. like was able to like make a deal with him or Convince something. Him or something. Yeah. Yeah, very, very odd though. Her father's car was towed and she got a ride back to the motel. And she ended up in Fred's room even though he didn't know she was there until he woke up the next morning. He claimed he didn't let her in and she didn't have a key to the room. So she might've slept for a while in the lobby before the front desk worker let her in. But in this case, Fred would have obviously woken up before someone was just let into his room. I mean, right. at a hotel. Yeah. They don't just let people into a room. I, again, like this could be just a scenario where you're in this smallish town mm -hmm. and people kind of know each other and it's, there's this comfortability there that doesn't exist in, you know, a bigger yeah. city area you know and maybe she just really did not want him to find out about this in the middle of the night because mm -hmm. that's like the worst case scenario waking your dad up to tell him you've done something bad <laughs> yeah right. so maybe she was just being as quiet as humanly yeah, possible that's true but it's important to note that there's no record of how many beds were in the room or if Mora slept in the room at all and how is there no record of that can't they just figure out what room they were staying in and go look was there not it's cctv been, in this motel? i know like, it's just been this big point of contention yeah, I don't know. At 4.49 a.m., Mora called Billy from her dad's cell phone. Hers was most likely dead, and she likely didn't have her charger with her. But this call was only a little over an hour after the accident happened. And Billy later said that Mora was upset about wrecking her dad's car, and he was able to calm her down and said she just needed to get some rest. And he promised to call her the next day. The next morning was Sunday, February 8th, and when Fred woke up, Mora told him about the accident. She was really apologetic and down on herself for making such a stupid mistake. Fred claims that he wasn't mad at all. He said he was just relieved that Mora wasn't hurt. And he said that he just told her not to worry because the insurance company would pay for everything. So here's a little clip of Fred discussing the car accident on the Montel Williams show in 2004. Well, uh, I was up visiting her for the weekend. Uh, she was needed a new car and we spent the afternoon looking around for a car to buy. We decided what type. Uh, that night we went out to eat. She got a call from one of her friends and she was going back to the dorm to uh, spend some time with a friend. She dropped me off at a motel that I was staying at, took my car and on the way back, 
from the, the dormitory, she had an accident, and uh, the cow was towed back, and she told me about it in the morning, and uh, I, you know, wasn't a actually all that upset. I was concerned with how I was going to get back to my job, because it was Sunday, and the, all the car places are closed, mm -hmm. so we made the arrangements, you know, and um, I uh, asked her to call me that evening, you know, because we had to talk about how to make out a police report and stuff like that. And she did. So like Fred said, he got a rental car and dropped Maura off at her dorm. He says that he even watched her walk in before driving home. And then around 11 that night, Fred called Maura and he told her that he needed copies of the accident report for the insurance company. And she said that she'd take care of it. And they planned to talk again on Monday night. An hour after Maura had talked to Fred, Maura started making some strange decisions. Just after midnight, she searched online for directions between Amherst, Massachusetts and Burlington, Vermont on MapQuest. It was a different time back then. I mean, Facebook was just getting started around this time. Flip phones, you know, she at 332, she emails in her homework assignment. And then the next day, Monday, February 9th, there was a huge snowstorm and all the classes at UMass were canceled. That morning, Billy called Mora several times and left multiple voicemails for her. That afternoon, she emailed him to say that she got his messages and would call him back later. Her email said, I love you more, stud. I got your messages, but honestly, I didn't feel like talking to much of anyone. I promised to call today, though. Love you, Maura. Instead of answering the email, Billy kept trying to call her, but she wouldn't pick up. At 1255, she had a three-minute call with the owner of a condo in Bartlett, New Hampshire. She got some information, but didn't agree to rent anything officially. Maura and her family had spent a lot of time in Bartlett when she was growing up, and she had already rented from that same condo association for family trips. It was a special place for her, one with positive memories and comfort. At 1.13, Mara called one of her classmates who she had borrowed a lab coat from because she wanted to return it. The classmate told her that she didn't have to, but later in that day, she heard a knock and found a bag of clothes in her hallway. Then at 1.24, Mora emailed her nursing school supervisor and she said that she had a death in her family and would be gone for the next week. She said that she'd let them know when she got back. But there wasn't a death in her family. And no one knows why she emailed this to her supervisor. There's been a lot of speculation. Did it mean something? Was it just an excuse? No one really knows. But at 2.05, Mora called 1-800-GO-STO, which is a tourist number from Stowe, Vermont. And the line was down. So she could only listen to the pre-recorded information about booking a hotel. At 2.18, she finally called Billy back, and he didn't answer this time. So she left a voicemail and said that they would talk soon. When she called, Billy was on the phone with Katie, trying to figure out what was going on with Mora. According to his friends, Billy could be controlling and possessive with Mora. He would check up on her sometimes when she was out with friends. So it wasn't that unusual that he called one of her friends to check on her. Billy tried to call Mora back three times at 221, 222, and 224, but Mora never answered. That afternoon, or sometime before then, Mora picked up her entire dorm room. She even took pictures off the wall, which was odd. She put all of her stuff in boxes and stacked them on top of the bed. Then she printed out an email from Billy and left it on top of the boxes. The email was between her and Billy, and it was about him cheating on her months before. They had either stayed together or got back together at some point after this had happened. At 3.30, she left campus in her Saturn. And 10 minutes later, she stopped at an ATM and withdrew 280 bucks, leaving just 16 in her account. No one knows why that number specifically was withdrawn. In surveillance footage, she doesn't look scared or stressed and no one else was with her. We will overlay that for those of you watching on YouTube. After she withdrew the money, she went to a liquor store and spent $40 on a box of Franzia red wine, Kahlua, Bailey's Irish cream, and vodka. Kind of an interesting mix. And at some point that afternoon, she picked up the accident report forms that her dad had asked her to get from the Massachusetts Registry of Motor Vehicles. So it does seem like she was planning to get them to him. Between 4 and 5 p.m., she left Amherst and drove toward White Mountains in New Hampshire, just over the Massachusetts border. At 4.37, she called the voicemail at her dorm, and this is the last time that she used her cell phone to make a call. At 5 p.m., her cell phone pinged off of a tower within 20 miles of Londonderry, New Hampshire. 
This was probably caused by an incoming call that she likely didn't answer. At 727, a resident of Woodsville, New Hampshire, reported a car accident off Route 12 to the Grafton County Sheriff's Department. The woman saw a black car up against a snowbank facing west in the eastbound lane. She told the dispatcher that she thought she saw a man in the passenger seat smoking a cigarette. This has never been confirmed. A second neighbor saw someone walking around the crashed car. An officer was sent to the scene immediately. Just before 7.30 p.m., Mara was driving eastbound on Route 112, and the roads were very bad from the recent snowstorm. And there were multiple sharp curves she had to navigate. I mean, you're driving through mountains pretty much. So Yeah, and this particular road is known to be difficult to drive in the winter. Right. So she lost control of her car on a curve, then slid off the road and hit a tree. When her car came to a stop, it was facing the wrong way. And the driver's side windshield was cracked and both airbags had been deployed. So she obviously hit it fairly hard. She was in a remote area miles away from any town, but there were multiple houses right around the crash site. The resident who first reported the accident later said that what she thought was a man smoking a cigarette might have just been light coming from a cell phone inside the vehicle. Mara had a Samsung flip phone with a small light that lit up when it was in use, as she was probably trying to just call someone, but there was no cell service in this area, especially back in mm-hmm. you know the early 2000s, cell services Right. sparse and especially remote areas mm-hmm. at 7 33 p.m a school bus driver named butch atwood saw mara on the side of the road on his way home from work he actually stopped and asked if she needed any help as she didn't really look hurt but she was shivering and clearly distraught so he didn't think that she was drunk or looked drunk mara told him that she had already called AAA and asked him not to call the police Mm-hmm. He knew she wouldn't have been able to get cell reception in that area, and AAA has no record of a call coming from Mora at all. Butch proceeded to go home and decided to call the police anyway, and he reported the accident at 7.43 p.m. At 7.46 p.m., Haverhill Police Sergeant Cecil Smith arrived on the scene, where he found the black car, but no one was around. There was serious damage to the front of the vehicle on the driver's side where it apparently hit a tree but there was no sign of the driver or footsteps in the snow leading away from the accident. That's what's so weird. The footsteps thing. Yeah. What? The car was also locked and he could see a box of red wine in the back seat, as well as red liquid on the driver's side door, as well as on the ceiling above the driver's seat. So Mm -hmm. could have been that the wine broke open during the accident or perhaps someone was drinking Mm -hmm. the wine in the vehicle. Could have been in the front kind of, you know, flew up to the top, got right. all over the place when, right. they, when she From the, the impact, accident. yeah. Soon EMTs arrived and they noticed a towel shoved into the tailpipe of the car. Sergeant Smith ran the license plate and found out that the car was registered to Fred Murray. When Butch Atwood saw the police car and EMT show up, he decided to come back out and told Sergeant Smith that he had actually talked to the driver of the vehicle. Supposedly, Butch and Sergeant Smith actually drove around the area looking for Mara, but there's no official record of this. The police thought that maybe because Mora had been possibly drinking that she had fled the scene of the accident. This is something that does happen a lot. People will leave, go sober up, and then come up with some story to come back and explain why they abandoned the car and what caused the accident. But that way they can't be nailed for a DUI, which is so much worse. So they thought it was one of those situations and that maybe she would come back once she sobered up. Between 8 o'clock p.m. and 8.30 that night, a contractor named Rick Forcier was coming home from work and saw a young person walking quickly along Route 112, about five miles from the crash. According to Rick, the person was wearing jeans and a dark coat with a light hood. And in the ATM surveillance footage that you saw earlier, Mara was wearing a light colored jacket. He didn't report the sighting until three months later though, when he checked his records and realized that the person that he probably saw walking along Route 112 could have been Mara. Mm -hmm. At 8.49 p.m., Mora's car was towed and the scene was cleared. Mike Lavoie, the owner of Lavoie's Towing, brought the car to his private home garage, which was standard procedure for him. And at 9.27 p.m., Sergeant Smith left the scene of the accident. So the following day on February 10th, 2004, the police put out a bolo for Mora Murray, identifying her by name at 12.36 p.m. At 3.20, they called Fred and left a message that his car had been abandoned but Fred was working out of state at the time and didn't actually get the message. 
Around 5 p.m., one of Morris' sisters called Fred to tell him what was going on, and he actually contacted the Grafton County Sheriff's Department right away. At 5.17, the police referred to Mara as a missing person for the very first time. So Wednesday, February 11th, 2004, early Wednesday morning, Billy was catching a flight from Fort Sill, Oklahoma to New Hampshire to help look for Mora. And while he was going through security, he missed a call and this person left a voicemail. But when he listened to the voicemail message, he heard soft breathing, crying, a whimper and sniffling, which was extremely unsettling to him, obviously knowing that Mora was missing. He called back and found out that the call was made using a prepaid calling card. He was sure it was Mora. Mara had used these prepaid calling cards all the time because there were times where she didn't have her own cell phone, which was normal in 2003. And the Thanksgiving before, Billy's mom had actually given Mora two prepaid phone calling cards. Billy eventually added her to his plan. So she did have a cell phone at the time, a Samsung flip phone, but it wouldn't be unlike her to use a prepaid calling card, especially because she might have still had it on her. At 7 a.m., Billy called his mom and told her about the call. He was frantic and he said he knew it was Mora, but there was no way to trace the call. An hour later, an official search was started for Mora. Fred and other family members and friends joined law enforcement in the search. And the police ended up using one of her gloves and had a dog trace the scent. And they traced it 100 yards before they lost the trail, leading investigators to believe that someone had possibly picked her up. But her dad was frustrated at the time that they used a glove that she didn't really use much. He said there were plenty of other items that would have had a more strong scent of Mora on them. Around 5 p.m. that evening, Billy was interrogated by police, first alone and then with his parents. And by 7 p.m., investigators concluded that Mora had driven to this area with plans to either run away or kill herself, which is crazy that they came to that conclusion so quickly, especially now that those possibilities are not the only possibilities for sure. Mora's car was actually at Michael Lavoie's private home garage for four days. And when investigators finally searched it, they found everything that Mara had left behind. An empty Diet Coke bottle with red liquid inside. It was definitely alcohol, and they smelled it, and probably the red wine, because the rest of the alcohol she bought was actually gone. Also inside the vehicle was Mara's AAA card, blank accident report forms, black leather gloves, makeup, diamond jewelry, CDs, map quest directions to Stowe and Burlington, college textbooks, a syllabus, birth control pills with three missing, an over-the-counter sleep aid like Tylenol PM, her favorite stuffed animal monkey, and a bag of clothes. Also inside was the book Not Without Peril by Nicholas Hauer, which is a book of stories about people who attempt mountain climbing before being fully prepared. Her wallet, license, credit cards, keys, and phone were missing, and they believe she took a black backpack with her as well. The items from her car were returned to her family that February. Ten days after Mora disappeared, the FBI stepped in to assist in the investigation, but never joined it full time. And at this point, the search was now a nationwide effort. New Hampshire authorities searched the area again, using a helicopter, thermal imaging, tracking dogs, and cadaver dogs. And found nothing. Uh, I mean, that's about as extensive of a search that mm -hmm. you could do, really. Mm -hmm. In July, investigators took the items from Mora's car back from the family for forensic analysis and did the first search of the area without snow. They never found any trace of Mora or any clue of what happened to her. Mora's family has continued to advocate for her, bringing attention to her case, especially Fred and Julie. Sadly, her mother, Laurie, died of cancer on Mara's birthday, actually, on May 4th, 2009. It's terrible, never knowing what happened to her daughter. They reached out to anyone or any show who has been willing to share Mora's story. Like we said, in 2004, Fred went on the Montel Williams show. Here's another clip of Fred talking about his relationship with his daughter. Mara and I, uh, well, sort of like best friends. I mean, uh, there's, there's a divorce. And uh, so I'd see her almost any day after school, you know, and uh, I'd coach her in all kinds of sports and like that. And now that she was in college, uh, I'd visit her maybe every uh, three weeks a month. We'd go away somewhere for the weekend. And oftentimes it led us to New Hampshire. We'd do things like climb mountains. Uh, we'd go running together, you know, for an hour at a time, things like that. And uh, we're buddies. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a, it's a different type of relationship. I mean, we're uh, father and daughter, but uh, friends. So in 2005, Fred petitioned the New Hampshire governor and the FBI to help with the case. 
He also sued multiple law enforcement agencies for access to case files. In 2006, the New Hampshire League of Investigators, 10 retired police officers and detectives, and the Molly Bish Foundation all joined the investigation. And by 2007, Let's Bring Them Home, a nonprofit that provides resources to families with missing loved ones, offered a $75,000 reward for information that leads to finding Mora. The investigation was then handed over to the newly formed New Hampshire Cold Case Division as a suspicious missing persons case in 2009. And Fred has been a very outspoken critic of law enforcement for treating the investigation as a disappearance and not a criminal case. By 2014, he stated publicly that he was sure his daughter was dead. There have been many possible sightings of Mora, especially in the Quebec area, but none of them have been verified. In 2017, investigators confirmed there has been no credible sightings of Mora since the night she disappeared. So that just really leaves us with the theories and possibilities of what happened to Maura Murray. And we're gonna get into all of those here in just a second. But first, one final ad break and we'll be right back. So we all know that shopping for new clothes can be needlessly stressful. So why not let Stitch Fix make it easy by doing the work for you so you can spend your time doing the things that you love instead. Personally, I hate shopping. I seriously hate going to the mall. I don't like being around a lot of other people, to be honest. And I like online shopping so much better. But sometimes I can get really stuck in a rut, just get the same things over and over again. And that's why I personally love Stitch Fix is they just really help me switch up my wardrobe and introduce me to pieces that I wouldn't have found otherwise. Maybe you've gotten used to the work from home routine, but has your wardrobe adjusted? Stitch Fix can help redefine your Zoom casual look. And that's the great thing about Stitch Fix is you can literally tell them what kind of clothes you're looking for and update them as you go through your subscription. So if you're in a phase where you're doing a lot of Zoom calls, you can ask them just for tops. Maybe you want to wear sweats on the bottom. Shopping for clothes can be time consuming, tedious and expensive. But fortunately, Stitch Fix has made it so much easier to find clothes that you love. I've been a Stitch Fix user for years on my own, paying for it by myself, and I truly love it. They offer clothing that is hand-selected by expert stylists for your unique size, style, and budget. It's completely different and a super fun way to find clothes that you'll love to wear. Every piece is chosen for your fit and your life. What's great is you can try on the pieces at home before you buy, then you keep your favorites and send back the rest. Stitch Fix has free shipping and easy returns and exchanges, and it is really easy. They just have this prepaid return envelope that's included. You throw everything in there, send it back. There's no subscription required. You can try Stitch Fix once or set up automatic deliveries. All you got to do is pay for the $20 styling fee for each box, but that gets credited back towards any pieces that you keep, and there are no hidden fees ever. Stitch Fix has styles and clothing to fit any occasion for women, men, and kids. They ship all over the U.S. and they're available now in the U.K. as well. So get started over at stitchfix.com slash mile higher and you'll get 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. That's stitchfix.com slash mile higher for 25% off when you keep everything in your fix. Stitchfix.com slash mile higher. Did you know cats are carnivores that need lots of meat? I didn't know leading cat food brands are often filled with fillers, grains, and very little protein. That's why I switched to Cat Person Cat Food. It's everything my cats need to stay happy and healthy. High quality, high protein meals delivered right to my door. And they'll do the same for you. And if you order your starter box today, I've arranged for Cat Person to provide an exclusive offer of nearly 50% off just for our listeners. If you've never heard of Cat Person before, it is protein packed cat food. 50% more than industry standards and only uses wholesome ingredients. The food is also grain free and low carb. So there's no room for those unnecessary nasty fillers you find in many of the other brands that can make your cat sick or cause digestive problems. Cat person delivers nutritious, delicious and high quality cat food right to your door, which is super convenient. So you don't have to run out to the store when you run out. Meal plans are fully customized for your cat or cats and cats of all ages. There are 16 easy to serve wet foods and three different dry foods. So be sure to find the combinations your cat will love. And they always ship for free with the meal plan. Our kitties go crazy for the shreds and broth. I don't know what it is about it, but I think it's the the broth that they love so much. They just lap it up. That's the first thing they eat. And then they devour the shreds. It comes in chicken, tuna, a bunch of different other flavors, and they absolutely love it. You also won't believe all that's included in your starter box I mentioned at the beginning. So listen to this. You'll get 10 cups of wet food, one two-pound bag of dry food, plus an entire set of serving spoons 
silicone lids and a scooper so you can keep it fresh in the fridge and not all stinky. And Cat Person offers a 30 day money back guarantee on your custom plan. If your cat doesn't love Cat Person, there's no questions asked. My kitties love it and I know yours will too. So go to catperson.com slash milehire and use code milehire to save nearly 50% on your starter box with free shipping. That's catperson.com slash milehire and use code milehire to get nearly 50% off your starter box with free shipping. Again, check out catperson.com slash milehire today and make sure you use code milehire. So of course, with not a lot of evidence pointing into any particular direction and so many possibilities of what could have happened to Mara, there have been so many theories put forward, a lot of them just by what you could call like armchair detectives at home. She disappeared a few days after the official launch of Facebook in 2004. And this is one of those cases that became kind of the first mystery in the age of social media where web sleuths have tried to solve the case and have presented a lot of different, really interesting ideas and theories. Yeah, I mean, the missing Maura Murray reddit is still active i mean there's still people out there trying to to figure out what happened to her yeah and you know some of it's good a lot of it's good some of it's really bad um there's been a lot of just misinformation put out there and a lot of toxicity people fighting with the families i mean there's a lot of drama surrounding this case um but everyone at the end of the day just wants to know what happened so for a while maura's friends thought that she took off to have an adventure or maybe, you know, a break from life. And they kept expecting her to come back eventually. So, of course, one of the biggest theories is that Mora possibly could have committed suicide. In press releases, Mora was described as being endangered and possibly suicidal. She might have been depressed and driving to a familiar, comforting place to harm herself or end her life. People who are planning to commit suicide often tie up loose ends tidy up their belongings, and Mara did that in her dorm room, sent out that email, returned the lab coat, and her breakdown at work could have been a big warning sign for this. In October of 2017, her sister Kathleen revealed what their phone call was about on the night that Mora was working at the security desk on campus. At the time of the phone call, Kathleen was a recovering drug addict who was just out of rehab. She checked herself in, and her fiancé was not supportive of her recovery at all when he picked her up from rehab he took her right to the liquor store so that night she called Mora and confessed that she had relapsed she was drinking and taking pills again and that probably would have been very upsetting for Mora to hear it's a lot to handle as a 21 year old college student and that could have explained why she stopped responding and went into a trance-like state maybe it was all too much for her and she felt like she was helpless and had no way of helping her sister She may have also been distraught over her relationship with Billy, which would explain why she printed out the email about him cheating on her and left it there. That seems very deliberate. She was clearly having issues with impulse control and knew that everyone would be disappointed in her if they found out how much she had been screwing up lately. It has also been brought up that maybe she was suffering from other mental health issues that were unknown to people at the time. Many people have brought up schizophrenia, possibly major depressive disorder, bipolar disorder, as those things can develop in the late teens or early 20s. And any of those conditions can cause a person to become suicidal, even if suicide does seem completely out of character for them. So it has to be considered. Maura's friends and family refuse to believe, however, that she would harm herself, based partly on the items that she brought with her when she left and the fact that there was no suicide note. They argue that she was making future plans, both long-term and short-term. And Billy's mom even said that they were talking about getting married. She'd also recently emailed her friends about going to see Dane Cook on February 12th, just days after she disappeared. No matter what she planned to do, she had packed up her dorm room and didn't seem to think she'd ever be back. I mean, even taking the photos off of the wall. What's strange is her friends Katie and Sarah have refused to talk to the media. When reporters and authors have tried to get in contact, they seem almost scared to talk. So no one really knows what happened at that party the night that Maura crashed Fred's car. At some point, Katie did tell Fred something that she remembered about the night of the party, but she has refused to speak about what that is publicly. So we have no idea. Yeah, I I think there's there's something they're withholding that would give us more inclination as to Mm -hmm. really Maura's state of mind and just what 
what might have happened or who might be involved with this. Mm -hmm. I think it, I think one of the things that brought me to the idea of suicide was she did let her teachers know that there was a death in the family. And mm -hmm. sometimes, I mean, sometimes people do things like that, you know, sort of like leave cryptic clues where, you know, they would say something like that. And in fact, they're talking about their own death. That is the death in the family. It's yeah. happened before, but in this yeah. case, I don't really see that being what happened. I don't mm -hmm. think, I think all signs kind of lead to, you know, either running away or foul play. Yeah. I think I, I just don't think it's that deep. I don't know if yeah. she necessarily connected it to that. Right. I think in college, sometimes professors are like real sticklers about missing class. Totally. And sometimes people will make up death in the family, especially if you have to leave suddenly for a whole week. Right. And what are, what's a professor going to do to prove that? Right. Know, versus like a medical mm -hmm. condition or something like that, where you can get a doctor's note. I mean, what are you going to do? I had a teacher make me prove that. Prove a, you went to a funeral? That's, yeah, absolutely. I had to give a death insane. certificate. Yeah, it's 100% a, a thing. Or like bring in a funeral pam pamphlet. Yeah. I have, I didn't have, happened to experience it but i was in a class for my friend that's insane had to provide it those professors yeah, which is fucking terrible it is yeah they terrible. should it should be illegal to do there that shouldn't be a, i mean it's stupid you're yeah. paying to be there why does it why are they trying 100 percent, especially for a prison, funeral like, like take my word for it right. I know. and if, it, if i am lying then you know what like that's my own issue you know what i mean like yeah. you don't need to be right you're an adult right you know why you're at school like but this maybe isn't, that's why she used that excuse because she was hoping that this particular professor would just take it and leave that like right. most professors a lot of them will be like so oh sorry my God, for death your in loss. the family yeah. like take whatever That's time a great you need point. versus like i'm sick okay well we need a doctor's note like yeah. most people wouldn't ask for proof of funeral but some fucking right. do i know so bad it's true yeah no that makes a lot of sense so another theory is that she ran away and one theory is that mara was responsible for a hit and run that put another student in a coma and she was fleeing the consequences of that accident this is a really interesting point of this case that a lot of people miss. This isn't this wasn't in a lot of the TV stuff. Yeah, uh, but it's pretty fascinating. It really is. So UMass student Patrice Vassi was found unconscious at 1220 a.m. on Friday, February 6, 2004. He had been hit by a car and was in a coma for a month. And Patrice doesn't remember the night of the accident, obviously. And the timeline doesn't match up with more schedule as she was working the security desk at Melville Hall. But some believe that someone else was driving her car that night, and the 12.40 a.m. call from a campus phone was that person telling her they had hit someone. Because within 20 minutes of that call, Maura was sobbing uncontrollably. Mm -hmm. Which it seems like the conversation with her sister wasn't emotional enough. It was an emotional talk, but not something that could set her completely over the edge. So who I mean, that it could person, have, then? but... I think this is more likely. You think this has to do with why Katie and Sarah won't talk? Potentially? Maybe. Maybe. That there's something they know? Yeah. Or whoever it was driving the vehicle? I if, think it's just so strange. Because um, Pat Patreet never figured out who did it. Wow. That's, that's just crazy. I know. Another theory is that she was running away from a relationship. When she and Billy were broken up, it's rumored that Mora dated her assistant track coach, Hossein Baghdadi, nicknamed Hoss. According to Hoss, she also hooked up with other guys on the track team who might have helped her run away. Having multiple sexual partners was impulsive and out of character for Mora, as far as we know. Maybe she did something she regretted with one of these guys or while drunk at a party, and some believe she might have even been pregnant. So running away could have seemed like the best option to sort of escape everything. But if Mara wanted to start over, maybe she had planned every move over those few days. She did have the skills and knowledge to survive on her own from her training at West Point Military Academy. Plus, she was an avid hiker and camper, not to mention a track star. Still, she may have gotten help from someone else, though. Haas claimed Mara told him she wanted to run away and start over. He also said Billy was too controlling for her always wanting to know where she was and then checking up on her to make sure she was actually telling the truth. Mora was part of the UMass outing club and the club slogan was, we take people out in the woods and do things with them. What the fuck? Yeah, that's a weird slogan. <laughs> Members of the club stayed at a cabin in the white mountains and anyone with an access code could get inside the cabin and it was free the weekend before and after she was missing. Haas was active in the club. So Mora could have gotten the access code from him. This would have been the perfect place for her to lay low until she could get a new ID and passport and then disappear across the border 
into Canada. There have been multiple possible sightings of Mara in the Quebec area, although none have been verified. If someone was helping her, maybe they were driving behind her the day she disappeared and picked her up. Mm. Or maybe that's the person who called her cell phone at 5 p.m. when she was driving to New Hampshire. It's possible her dad was also the person helping her, as he did change his story about the night he took Mora and Katie to the liquor store. Someone also withdrew $4,000 from his bank account from multiple ATMs shortly before Mora's disappearance, and he claims he withdrew the money for her new car. However, the money was never put back, even though Fred's home was foreclosed on for not paying taxes. So there's no logical reason for him to withdraw that amount of cash for a car or from different ATMs. I mean, mm-hmm. the reasoning for doing multiple ATMs would be the limit. Usually a lot of ATMs are like $500 limit, so that would make sense for him to get 4000 You have to go to multiple ATMs. Mm-hmm. But again, why? Yeah, and I mean, you never want to think that a family member could be involved in something like this, especially with her being on her own, getting into an accident. It's hard to even wrap your mind around how that could happen. And I know her family does not like the idea yeah. of people even bringing up that Fred could have been involved, Aided but I in think her disappearance. I think for Maura's sake, it's important to just say all the information because it is strange. Let's talk about also the, the rag in the tailpipe. This is really, really weird. Fred actually told police before, I mean, they had already found it at the crime scene, but he offered up the information. I was the one who told Maura to put the rag in her tailpipe. He said that, Her car had been having issues and that this is supposed to help it. However, when you look, I've never heard of that personally. I'd love to hear any of you who have been told to do that. But from what I've read and just people answering on like Yahoo answers, um, that's like a sure way to ruin your car. Yeah, it is. It's if the tailpipe is blocked and the engine's exhaust can't get out, the fresh fuel and air have no room to come in. So the engine bogs down. So that would literally Mm -hmm. cause it to stall. Mm -hmm. And sometimes explode due to backfires yes and i know tim and lance from the missing mora uh murray podcast which is a fantastic podcast they do a great job they looked into this a lot and they did have some people in their audience that said they had been told this at times in their life too by their father or grandpa or whatever that you stick the rag in there well you're not like helps it yeah well there's still air for it to you know it's not gonna depending on how you put it in there too Mm -hmm. and how big the rag is i mean there's a lot of factors that could play in it like if you put a handkerchief in there that's what's interesting is like wouldn't there be enough air to like push exhaust to push the rag out of it maybe i don't don't know know. yeah i don't really understand how that helps anything stuff it in there for it to like actually completely fuck your car and it's like a wet rag but then Uh. it's backfiring things into your right engine right right so it will destroy your car like that's literally horrible advice but we can't necessarily say that fred was trying to destroy her car or uh do something to her in any way because that really could have just been something he thought yeah was a legitimate it could be like some weird old old school i think it is old school like a wives tale because that happened (laughs) yeah (laughs) Yeah, i guess that's not the right term (laughs) but like you know there's always things where you're like oh you're not supposed to do that oh i was always told you were or whatever like it wouldn't really surprise me. Mm-hmm. Here's 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 a theory. Maybe Fred, you know, like uh, this idea that Fred did something malicious to her, it, I don't think is is true at all. I think what could have happened is what if there was all of these things swirling, you know, crimes committed, accidents, somebody got hit in her vehicle and Fred knew about it and what if Fred did actually in fact help her get out of the country and get to canada and she is actually living in canada and you know under you know even her name or some other name and fred in fact did help her get there to help escape all the trouble that she was in here Mm -hmm. in the united states i mean that's a possibility yeah like i mean i think anything's a possibility with this case that's what's so wild about it is we really don't have anything. So your mind can go a million different ways and multiple scenarios kind of check out and make sense. Um, but I know, which is purely speculation. Cause obviously yeah. Fred would hundred percent deny that accusation yeah. completely. Mm-hmm. And you know, but it and is that's strange. fine, but it is strange. And like also going back to the liquor store that night, not being able to remember if he went in with them or yeah. if he didn't changing his story. I mean, it is odd. You have to note that it's odd for there's Morris pieces sake. missing from the timeline that shouldn't be missing mm-hmm. from the timeline. 
in a, a logical world, right? There mm -hmm. should be, we should have more information to piece together exactly where everybody was in right. the hours leading up to her leaving. And it just seems like there's people that know things that aren't saying things for a reason. I mean, people mm -hmm. don't just keep quiet about something like a person's disappearance if they have nothing to hide, right? Mm -hmm. So there is a reason why they're withholding information from the authorities. And I think it's to protect Mora because Mora was in tr was in serious trouble due to these accidents. That's really the theory could, you align with most. Yeah, I really think that. I think she, and not only that. I mean, I think there is also an element with uh, with Billy and the fact that maybe there is some. You know, obviously she she cheated on Billy, and we don't with the track coach. There's this whole angle of it. Mm -hmm. It really seems like Mora was just kind of going off the rails and and was getting herself dug into this hole that she wasn't sure she could get out of and maybe she was like i need to get i need to just disappear because yeah. all of this is catching up to me and it's not going to end well for anybody so really so that's what you think up. could have really happened do you think fred was involved in that or yes okay. i i think i think fred at least knows something i don't know if he knows ultimately where she is but i think he knows a lot more than what he has mm -hmm. said and, and I again this is purely speculative right. i want right. to point that out but there there are a lot of people out there that agree with you and there's been just a lot of because clearly confirmed things yeah. about their relationship was it as good as they portrayed right. it um i know mora's stepfather um which that's a dicey situation too because her mom cheated on her dad uh, and he he went through a really hard time with that. He was very angry and upset over that. And her stepfather has come forward and said that uh, Fred is not the guy that people right. think he is, that he didn't help as much in the search, that he didn't seem concerned. But all of that, we don't know if that's true because that's coming from this guy who hates him. They right. have fought for right. years. Uh, so who really knows? I mean, I I would hate for... I mean, that, that's got to be really hard if you truly had nothing to do with it and you just want to find your daughter. To totally. And I see how that would pointing be the absolutely finger at you. angry, you know, yeah. make you angry but it can't to hear that. But you can't over. until we can rule it out. You can't mm -hmm. just put that off of the table. I mean, I think the theory that she died of the elements is not the case. No, There's no. no footprints that led from the accident that night. No, we would have found something. And Yeah, exactly. She mm -hmm. would have been found by now with all the dogs going around everywhere and how far could she have realistically gone on foot, you know, before somebody would have come in contact with her, whether she was alive or dead and so nothing happened. You believe more is alive. And honestly, honestly, which is crazy because uh, I'm completely changing what I thought about this before. But I know I'm like just from what we talked yeah, about a few weeks ago. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Like now that I'm like, everything's for some reasons clicking for me and, and the, the Fred part just really like, hit home for me during this episode and i'm like whoa i think i think everything was catching up to her and she was in or so much something worse happened yeah, or, or she was involved in that at car accident right or she was literally really going to face serious jail time that would potentially ruin her entire life potentially or something else could have even or, happened that we don't know about at the party the she could have been pregnant preg yeah. i mean there's so many different but i just think there's so many things swirling around her that one of them's got to stick that the yeah. the chances that it's just random whether mm -hmm. a random killing or randomly kidnapped by some nefarious individual in the area and then murdered it seems most likely that she she was picked up at the accident and who, or she had a driver in tandem with her or somebody followed her and it was a staged accident Mm -hmm. in order to make it look like she just disappeared but then she was taken across the border and into really Canada. started a new yeah, life literally started a new life to escape all of the problems and i mean really her life was a mess at the time mm -hmm. of the accident her her life was she had all these affairs too you know it's billy possible was she could have had billy mad at her or even her father maybe she thought fred would be angry at her for having affairs when his wife broke his heart the same way Maybe she couldn't face her family. I mean, there's so many possibilities. Um, I think it's interesting that you believe she's alive because my gut tells me she's not. But, but why? Because, 
I mean, we haven't gotten yeah. into the rest of it. <laughs> I guess let's, <laughs> There's let's slow down There's other reasons why I think that. Okay, so let's talk about the idea that she was kidnapped potentially. Okay. So after the accident, maybe she accepted a ride from, you know, the wrong person or was actually forced into another vehicle. Whether that's at the scene or she left the scene yeah. and then was picked up along the way because right. someone else saw her five miles from the scene. Right. So exactly. Is it someone she knows? Is it someone she contacted or is it just a random person? Right. No one I did. No one knows. So her family members now believe this is unfortunately what happened to her. But with multiple people seeing the car accident, it's hard to believe no one saw her get into a car just a few minutes later. At first, Fred believed that she had wandered away and was hurt, but he quickly changed his mind and said she must have been taken against her will. Knowing she'd be charged with identity theft and credit card fraud if she got into trouble again, accepting a ride may have felt like her only choice. So it's been suggested that she was abducted by this Rick Forcier character, the contractor who reported the sighting of her three months after the fact. Some believe two local brothers kidnapped and murdered her. Larry and Claude Moulton, who lived in an A-frame house a mile from where Mara crashed. And when we last covered this, this was kind of just, this, they were just scene, digging yeah. into this. Right. And there were local rumors going around that they killed Mora in that house, as Claude had a criminal record and Larry had a history of drug use. Former police officer John Smith presented evidence for Mora's case, claiming she was murdered by Larry and Claude. Fred has claimed that Larry sent him a rusty stained knife that he found in Claude's glove compartment. Claude and his girlfriend were allegedly acting strange after Moore's disappearance was reported. And Claude and other family members said Larry was just trying to get reward money by framing him for the murder, which would also make sense too. Fred gave the knife to police, but they've never released any information about it. Several days later, Claude scrapped his Volvo car, which I guess where the knife mm -hmm. came out of the glove department compartment. In 2006, the new owners of the A-frame house allowed John Smith to come in and search. Cadaver dogs alerted to an upstairs closet, and carpet samples were taken to be tested for blood and human remains, but no information was ever released about those tests. John searched the house again in 2016 when it was an abandoned property, and he went with the podcast Missing Maura Murray, Tim and Lance, and wood in the closet was discolored, possibly from blood, and they sent samples of the wood to a molecular geneticist. And it was definitely human blood and not animal blood. There were two different DNA profiles, one from a male and one that was unknown. And the sample was unfortunately too degraded for further testing to be done. But a new technology may change that in the future. So maybe we'll get to the bottom of what DNA is on that. Yeah, the whole A-frame yeah. theory is ugh, another headache. Because, I mean, it really could have happened. It Any of these yeah. things could have happened. Right. If Mara was kidnapped and murdered, some believe her case could be connected to other missing women. For example, 16-year-old Molly Bish went missing from Warren, Massachusetts four years earlier, and her body was found three years later, and the case is still unsolved. Another example is the disappearance of 17-year-old Brianna Maitland, and she went missing one month after Mara went missing. Brianna's vehicle was found abandoned 100 miles from Mora's, and she's never been found. So potentially there's some type of serial killer on the loose, but the police have dismissed the serial killer theory and any connection between Mora's disappearance and these other cases. It would just seem like for that to have happened, it would have had to play out just perfectly for this serial killer. Yeah. You know? Yeah. What are the, unless he was like stalking or he or she was stalking her long before that, but there's no evidence or mm -hmm. really anything to suggest that's the case. But again, you never it know. Could have happened. You never know, man. The wildest things can happen. Mm -hmm. It's also possible that Mora was abducted and killed by someone she knew and had confided in at some point. Friends claimed her boyfriend Billy was controlling and possibly abusive, and in 2019, he was indicted on one count of felony third-degree sexual abuse for attacking a coworker, Kate Pattison, in 2011. Kate came forward in 2017 after learning about Billy's connection to Mora. So that's like that's something that's sort of playing out right now, still still going through oh, the court system yeah. and everything, and. This really tells us a lot about Billy's character mm -hmm. and it is a possibility that he is involved in her disappearance. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it would seem that he would have motive for it as well. Yeah. And there's a lot more about Billy out there that we're not going to get into just for the sake of time. And, and it's because pretty salacious it's so, too. It is. It's speculative, um, some of it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, Billy's an interesting character in this whole thing too. Right. It's possible he was involved. There's also the theory out there of a police conspiracy. Unanswered questions about this case have led some to question law enforcement's possible involvement. How did the police determine that Mora was a driver of the abandoned car? 
what made them issue the bolo identifying her by name the next day. They called Fred almost three hours later, and how did they know Fred wasn't involved in the accident? Because again, this was the, the Saturn that was registered to Fred, right. so how they know Mora would have been in the vehicle. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, but police, they have their ways of getting information. Yeah, I mean, it wouldn't have been that hard. There. There's also past accidents mm -hmm. with Mora on the reports, so it probably wouldn't be that hard for them to figure mm -hmm. that out. Butch Atwood was the only witness who saw a young woman, and a second witness said she saw a man smoking a cigarette. What made them eventually decide she was a missing person versus a drunk driver who fled the scene of an accident? Well, probably the fact that she never showed back up. Right. One answer is that the police talked to Fred Jr. after issuing the bolo. Who is her brother. Fred Jr. explained that Mora was driving the car and that this was a missing persons case. He then called Kathleen, who called Fred Sr., According to Sergeant Smith, Kathleen allegedly said that Mora had gotten into a fight with her dad over the weekend and was driving to the mountains to kill herself with alcohol and pills. So again, this is allegedly according to Sergeant Smith. Yeah. But that's that's pretty interesting. Mm -hmm. Why would he lie about that? Why would he assume his sister was missing before assuming her car had even been stolen? Yeah. That's what I'm saying is there's so mm -hmm. there's so many missing pieces here that just don't make sense. Right. So, I don't know. It's unlikely the police were directly involved in this case, but many have still criticized how they handled it, especially early on. By initially treating Moore's disappearance as a drunk driver who fled the scene, they missed crucial hours of searching. Which I get, but also at the same time, I also get how you roll up on that scene and mm -hmm. you, you know, based on your experience, you would go, okay, this is a drunk driver, you know, that obviously led, walked away or got into another vehicle versus jumping into, mm -hmm. you know, this is, you know they're trying to figure it out this that's pretty normal to do that i feel like so i don't know if you can really hit the police that hard on it i think they did a fairly good job at least of discerning what was going on and you know they're getting different information from different people mm -hmm. so i mean how are i mean you it's really? hard to like really judge it unless you're the family and that's you true know and yeah you know, i mean what close. do i know as far as how the police were so when we talked to James Renner recently, we had him on the show who runs a fantastic blog about Mara Murray. Um, and he had talked to us about the theory of a tandem driver. We talked about that quite a bit. It seemed like you really s started leaning that way. Yeah. So what made you kind of change your mind from that? Well, I, if you haven't watched the episode, James Renner believes that it's possible she got into a tandem vehicle and then she was taken somewhere else where it could have been somewhere familiar, but that ultimately she was likely murdered at, a different, at a different location and even potentially at a different time. I mean, we just don't know at what point that would have happened. It's all up for speculation. But the, the more I've kind of put things together, the whole picture together, it seems to me like, you know, you have to go back to the packing you have to go back to her brain. I mean, she brought a lot of stuff with her mm -hmm. in in the car. And I mean, maybe, you know, it is curious that she didn't like empty everything out of the vehicle mm -hmm. that she brought with her into whatever other vehicle she got into because she did leave a lot of stuff behind that. If you were going to go start a new life somewhere, you'd mm -hmm. probably want to bring with you. But don't you think it's strange that she brought textbooks? Because if she wasn't planning to come back, why would she bring her books from school? Well, that's what I'm saying is maybe maybe that was part of the staging of of the disappearance or or she just or she was drinking at the time of the accident mm -hmm. and she just forgot, just like forgot to bring that stuff with her or something like that. But I, I see. But that's a, I see why people think that she could have been murdered because it just seems like there's all these indications that she was going to come back. I mm -hmm. mean, she was making plans with friends and things like that. Mm -hmm. So why would she just, you know, decide to go start a new life? Unless something happened right. where she had to leave. That's what I'm saying is like maybe something happened. I know I, where yeah. they, you know, it was just a spur of the moment type of thing. And she had had these conversations with her friends prior, but then something happened or something. She knew something was going to happen to her potentially even. And people really do go and start completely new lives. And that might be part of the reason why her friends aren't talking because they don't want to let anyone know where she possibly could have gone. Maybe they're protecting her. Maybe her being found would ruin her new life that right. she has, you right. know? 
Um, I think it's really hard to say at the end of the day, like I cannot just land on a certain theory because there's so many possibilities. I know with James, we also talked about the possibility of her joining some type of like group or cult. Yeah. Um, there has been some sightings of her, but none of them have been confirmed. Well, what uh, about all these sightings group. in Quebec? Right. Like they're all bogus, all of them? Well, they might be. I mean, yeah, sightings are hard because it's like it's not like the people are going up. Can I see your ID? They're yeah. just like, oh, that she looks roughly like yeah. Marie. And, and if she really is out there, don't you think she changed her appearance quite a bit? So, right. Exactly. Um, I mean, you would think, but uh, but if you go to Canada where no one knows you, then I thought it was pretty interesting though that James was seemed to have been taking the theory that she could have joined some type of group and is living off grid, um, because that does kind of make some sense. And I think it's interesting that her track coach who was close with her, had some type of relationship with her, knew a lot about her, said that she was trying to run away. And maybe one of those guys on the track team was the one who was following her and helping her make that final move. Maybe whatever happened at her last shift was the final thing to push her over the edge that I need to, I need to leave. Right, right. Um, Things are starting to really spiral. like fall apart. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Or she just had a had an accident. Knew she was drinking. Knew she was in trouble. Walked away disoriented, and someone really did pick her up. That's yeah. completely possible too. Right. And that's why I just can't land on anything. I'm curious, Janelle. Do you have any theory that you kind of lean towards? I kind of feel like she's probably not alive. Really? I don't know. I just feel like, or honestly though, maybe she's in Canada. Cause that theory is really interesting too. Mm -hmm. Like she fled, she was going through a lot of shit. She was, you know, didn't want to get in trouble more than she already was going to. And then the, the fact that her dad, I don't know. I don't want to be speculative and be like, yeah, her dad had something to do with it, but right. It's but just it's possible. It, he it's totally helped possible. Her. He helped her. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But I don't know. Sometimes, even if that is happened, like, I just feel like the kidnapping thing's also likely, even though no one saw her technically, like mm -hmm. that doesn't mean a lot. Like, no, you know, she could easily be swiped up and then gone. And Again. whether she's alive because of that, I don't know. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's why this case is so perplexing and talked about so much mm -hmm. because really any of these theories could it's be like possible. She just got plucked out of thin air. Yeah. That's how it seems like she just truly vanished. This is interesting though. There was a post on, reddit i believe uh it was a while ago a couple of years ago where a therapist anonymously um as far as i know posted that they actually treated mara murray in canada and that she had actually said that she staged the accident to get away from her dad and her boyfriend I, and then the post was quickly deleted after i don't think that's so i mean at all. obviously yeah. a lot most people are like yeah, reddit, it's fake right the therapist yeah. is not allowed to do that that's or, you know, yeah, what kind if of anybody found out, they would that. strip. Your license would be gone in five seconds. And, and why would jail. Mora even do that? That right. seems risky. Like, I don't know. Yeah. Reddit's a place of I was going to say, I could see someone. Just, yeah, exactly. Oh, it's just, I think this is going to be one that we all, I don't know if we'll ever get the answers. Um, there's still a lot of things going on. There's still drama happening constantly between the family and web sleuths and mm -hmm. everyone's fighting over what could have possibly happened. There's been a lot of drama with Billy. We talked a little bit about that with James, that there's been some more stuff coming up about his past. Um, so yeah, any which direction you go down, you can come up with a way that it mm -hmm. would have been possible. And that's why this remains one of the most talked about missing persons cases of all time. And will we ever get the answers? I don't know. I doubt it. I truly doubt it. I think that would be. I think the only way we would get an answer if she's still alive, like if she's yeah, passed, she comes I don't think we'll ever no. figure it out. I agree. But if you. she is for some reason alive or in mm -hmm. hiding or is kidnapped and was somehow able to get free, like that's the only way I think maybe we'd figure it out. But if she's, Ugh. if she's passed, like I don't think we would ever right. find her body or evidence, evidence. It's that been she's so been dead. Yeah. Yeah. I agree. And the idea of her being out there, it, I mean, it gives me chills, right? Just thinking oh, she could yeah. be out there and I like think watching all of this unfold. I, or, I'm like very certain. Do you she think is. her parents know 
she's out there i don't think they know where she is but i think they know that she's alive you're very certain from your own perspective. no i know i know no i yeah <laughs> no which one is knows. fine right i'm not saying I that i am you're certain I about am your god opinion. i know what's happened <laughs> No, but I'm, <laughs> I'm just saying that based on everything and you look at, so like, this is interesting too. So there was a phone call made to Pottsville, Pennsylvania, and somebody that worked as a social worker said that there's contacts in that area for people that run like an underground railroad who provide fake passports and mm. things like that. There's also the, I, the thing that she was calling multiple rental places to try to find somewhere to stay yeah. why would she be calling different rental places of different sizes and different areas particularly well, that are all leading her towards to stay somewhere towards canada though yeah there, you know but this was also a place that she went a lot with her mm-hmm. family she right been just trying to like, yeah there was that mind. there was mm-hmm. a one place that she had been to before but like you know it seems pretty clear that she was trying to run away i Maybe. mean it seems like that is that's yeah, that coming from the I guess the email, based the email that, thing was right. so bizarre. Yeah, mm-hmm. and like there's, there's death, so there's much no to run from. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and is. the fact that so like, and also why did she, when she crashed, why did she tell Butch not to call the police? And that also wow. makes me think that she probably wasn't drunk. She probably wasn't drinking and driving. So if that was the case, she hadn't been drinking and driving. Well, I think she was. Well, she, there was yeah, Butch said there that, was wine in the diet coke yeah, but, can. Okay, but that doesn't make you drunk, well, though. Well, maybe she wasn't drunk, yeah. She could have just been lightly sipping and driving. and Or it could have been completely staged, like you said. And there was a, someone else who they had this all planned. That's I, what I'm, well, that's God. what I'm saying, too, is they, she didn't want the police to come to the scene right. because of what reason. But why, if you were staging it, why wouldn't you want them to come to the scene? Or maybe you want to get out of there and get as right. far away from it as you can before the they get there. Are, that's true. So that's what I'm saying. Is she like If this was just her going to get away and like, what like why wouldn't she want the police to like come and like obviously there's alcohol in the car and that would have been an issue but is you know is that enough to just be like no 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 i don't want any of that and hmm. and really insist to butch and then butch was like okay i thought it was weird himself that she was like so adamant about that obviously she would have gotten in trouble for the open container in the hmm. vehicle but what it sounds like she wasn't actually drunk so she probably wouldn't have gotten into as much trouble as you would think that's a good point so it seems like it was like holy shit he's gonna call the police they're gonna come i gotta get out i gotta get the hell out of here and so she either she takes off running down the road Mm. and she gets miles away from the accident before somebody comes and picks her up or whoever i mean for all we know she could have met somebody we don't even know their identity Mm -hmm. in the area that's a part of this underground railroad that's helping her get to canada i mean there's there's literally i mean there's the dark web for a reason there's people that do this for a living that help people disappear that help people get fake passports and how active was that stuff at the start of facebook days i have no the dark web do you know like well i mean I don't know. Or it was somebody she knew that knew somebody. I mean, hmm. it could have been. There's lots of ways that people. I mean, it's not like there's never been you right. know, ways to contact these people that work in these shadowy right. it's existed underground the groups. Internet. Yeah. Right. There's ways <sighs> to find these people. So it's I think it's very possible that life was literally all catching up to her. Mm-hmm. And she felt like there was no escape from it other than to just start over. I mean, she's she kind of like really screwed things up in her current life she was at west point yeah Mm -hmm. and then like derailed from there and for all i mean for all we know dad's car possibly could have been involved in that other accident for all we know maybe she was there was a lot maybe she was planning to just go away for a bit and try and like reset her life and then Mm -hmm. like come back she was never meaning to like literally disappear off the face of the earth forever right and then something whack happened and she got her in more trouble or or something hurt her just or, seeing how big this blew up that's freaked true. her out or was like i'm not coming back now after this is like fucking worldwide news and yeah. people are on the internet talking about me and right like, and people have used tons of resources mm-hmm. and time and mm-hmm. yeah that she might just be freaked out what would her family think if she just mm-hmm. came back all of a sudden you know now it's like way too late to come right. back so yeah. god the idea of her being out there just really Ooh, yeah, it's wild. that makes me feel so weird. Tons of people do it. Um, Tons they of people do. do it. They really do. Uh, it's not as hard as you think wow. to just disappear and and 
especially in 2004. I mean, when there's little technology to really track I don't know really why my you. instinct just tells me she's not alive. I do too. But and I don't know why exactly. I just, yeah, I truly don't know why I don't have but anything then, strong so then to back who? that up. So who and how and how, why isn't well, there there's a lot more evidence know. to point that direction is what I'm saying. Is like there's well, no evidence to point to that she was murdered by at least anybody that we know of. No, I mean, the police have but, looked at all the people in her circle mm -hmm. and there's not enough evidence to, you know, go after Billy at this point or so anybody else. So. And she really, sorry. I was going to say it could have just been a rando then that yeah, picked her up. That's true. Put her in sex trafficking, sold her. I mean, who knows Yeah, what I happened? Mean, literally a million things could have happened. Um, but going off of the idea that she really had planned to leave for good, do you think someone could pull something like that off in today's day and age? Yeah, people do it. Like like today yeah, with all absolutely. social media and cell absolutely. phones and all that. Absolutely. Yeah, cuz well, you do can you think I guess I should rephrase the dark that. Web do you think that this right case would have shaken out the same way if it took place in 2019 or well, something? Well, if she, yeah. Well, if she took her cell phone and things like that, I mean, it, would have your digital more, footprint's a lot larger now, so plus just the amount you, of texting, social media use, there yeah. would have been more information to gather from her life and what was going on at the time. I mean, mm -hmm. but you can still do it. I mean, there's burner yeah. phones. There's ways to no, do you it. Can, but I think it would have been harder. Yeah. Oh, I don't know, man. This case gives me such a headache. I, I just really hope one day we get some answers. But something tells me we're not going to. How old would she be now? She would be, I want to say 30 something. Will you look it up? 36, I want to say. Because like a lot of people, a lot of people are like, oh, well, there's nothing to indicate that Mara would have been, you know, smart enough or have the ability to make mm -hmm. herself disappear by herself. But like people are forgetting that there are these yeah. groups and people out there that help you. will literally help you do it. And, mm -hmm. you know, it would make sense that I think someone you need would money for her. that, too. Right. Don't you have to pay these people? They're not just doing it out of the kindness of their I'm, hearts. Well, there was four thousand dollars taken out. Oh, yeah, by Fred. Yeah, that's what I'm saying is like, I think there are people close to Mora that at least know what happened to her. By the way, Maybe. she would have been 39, 39, which then brings me to my next question. What if she was pregnant and had a kid? What if like or what if she just got pregnant after and ha has a kid somewhere out there? Yeah. What if the kid one day comes forward and is like, yo. Yeah, that's that's a complete possibility. Mm. Wow. Yeah, that's trippy to think about. Right? Being Mara, Mar 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 Mar's kid. Mm -hmm. If she really was pregnant at the time, right. they'd be old now. Yeah. And um, like the largest number of sightings of her are in Quebec. Mm -hmm. mm. She could just be living there. Yeah. And Maybe like, she just doesn't want to be found. Well, yeah. clearly, if she's still gone, if she's out there, she doesn't want to be found. Right. Right. So I, I think it's I think it's very possible. I really do. And I think that that you know this is there's it's a there's a reason why this case just continues to you know drive people Probably crazy always because will. because i believe the answers are there we just can't access them because they're held by the people closest to her and mm. and that's why we just until they come forward but we i mean we have to remember happened, though we don't know that we don't know that they have all we this don't know it but mm -hmm. then why aren't they explaining why aren't like they explaining friends. all these other things there's mm -hmm. thing there's things that i've read that literally well, say fred searched for police. like three hours and then wouldn't cooperate at all like he would not try that hard to help and and there's well, all there's these things. things said but we don't know if any of those things are true i mean it's well, very hard yeah i feel i really feel for her family members because i know they've just been through hell but yeah, I do think for Mara's sake, you have to you have to look at all the possibilities. You have to talk about Fred. You can't not yeah. discuss it. I so. mean, there's questions that don't yeah. we don't have answers to that mm. directly correlate with Fred knowing something about the disappearance. I just wish we knew more about what happened that night at the at her job. Yeah. I think there's more to that for sure. Yeah. But we obviously could continue to speculate about what could have happened to Maura Murray all day, but we want to hear your thoughts, of course, in the comments below. Let us know your theory or what makes the most sense to you. Maybe there's a theory that we left out. I know there's so many different possibilities online laid out. So if any of those have really stood out to you, definitely share them with us. But that is going to be it for Mile Higher Podcast this week. We will be back again next week with another true crime episode. 
But until then, make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes or Apple Podcasts. I always say <laughs> iTunes and Spotify. Also, you can support our channel by subscribing on our YouTube channel and clicking like on the video. That really helps us out. Yeah. And check out Higher Love Wellness. Oh, uh, yeah. Check out the Watermelon Haze. We really appreciate it. Mm-hmm. But that's it for us. Until next time. Always take your mind a mile.